Well, good morning, Church at the Red Door. Good morning, friends and family. I want to welcome you here to Morning Mix on this uh, wonderful, glorious Sunday morning. Boy, good morning, hey, Paul. Well, hello, Randy. I was wondering if you were going to say hello to me or not. <laughs> hey, let me ask you, was it, was it warm enough for you? You know, last week, I think it was oh, tall. I call it toasty. <laughs> toasty. How warm how, how, how was in it? In my backyard, I mean, I know they say different, but my backyard said it was 121 wow. in my backyard. Wow. So, so it was... It was toasty. Yeah, boy, it's hot. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, this is summertime in the desert. It, yes, and it that's is. why a lot of our community here, a lot of our folks are not in the desert right now. Yeah, they're <laughs> the smart ones, aren't they? Exactly. <laughs> they're not us. Exactly. Uh, oh. And speaking of today. Yes. Well, you know what today is, don't you? No, do you know what today uh, is? Today's Father's Day. <laughs> it's Father's Day. Yes, so it first is. off, yes, happy Father's Day to all happy your dads Father's and Day. all you your bet. future dads. But I have yeah. to tell you, I was out... Uh, on my morning walk and I ran into a, a woman and I said, you know, do you remember any funny stories, anything with your dad growing up? And she said, you know, when I was, she goes, I was probably, she goes, third or fourth grade and I had a homework assignment right. and it had math equations. And she goes, so I, I, I wanted to go outside and play with my friends. You know, they're knocking at the door. Remember when you grew up, kids used to yes. come knock at your door? Yes. You'd yes. actually go out of the house and go play games. Remember yes. that? Yes. Not to sit in front of a computer. Well, uh, but, but she wanted to go, but her mom says, you're not leaving until you get your math equation homework finished. Well, you know, she's crying and all that. Mom walks away. Next thing you know, Dad it's, comes it's, by. It's, oh, no, it's coming quick. Next thing you know, Dad comes by and Dad's, Dad goes, honey, what are you crying about? She goes, I want to go out and play, but Mom says, I can't go till I finish my, finish oh, my math okay. equations. And so, okay. so, so Dad goes, I'll tell you, I want to make you a deal, honey. You can go on out and play. I'll finish your math equations for you. There you All go. right, just don't there tell you your go. mother. There you go. So the little girl comes back in, and when she comes back in the house, her mother's really upset with her, and the little girl can't figure out why. Why are you so upset? She goes, I'm so upset with you. You got every one of those math equations <laughs> wrong. wrong. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes dads step in and try to help out and do the right thing. It doesn't that's, always turn that's out. That's right. You know? No, that's right. That's right. That's good. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, being Father's Day, do you know that yesterday, Saturday, was the 111th anniversary of Father's Day that started back in 1910? No, I didn't know that. Spokane, Washington. Oh, really? Yeah, and it was uh, a woman who wanted to uh, honor a vet who was raising six kids by himself. That's how it all started. Wow. So it's been around for over 100 years. Wow, that's amazing. Wow. So... Um, Tell me, I have a question for you. As always, every week there's a question for me. Okay, How many is... fathers do you think there are in the United States? You know, actually, I know that one. What? Yeah, I know that one. Okay. But it's, a, it's 121 million wow. fathers. Wow. 121 million fathers. 76% of all Americans will celebrate Father's Day. Did right? you know that? I did not 76%. know that. 76%. I did all not know Americans. that. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a big, big celebration. Oh, it's a big number. Oh, yeah, and people. now with restaurants back opening and everything, it's going to be great. Yes, yes. Yeah. I thought dads were in the backyard barbecuing well, on Father's Day. Well, you're probably absolutely Except right. Except here in the desert. <laughs> that's right. right. Well, it's nice here in the desert. You don't have to turn the grill on. You just <laughs> put the true. food on and it just That's cooks. true. <laughs> so. so with, you know, with 75%, 76% celebrating, I'm wondering why, you know, this statistic here coming up, my statistics right? yeah sure oh yeah it wouldn't be a morning mix without one <laughs> a third almost a third of all the kids today in the u.s live in a home without a father without a bio father a wow. stepfather or an adopted father wow. i mean it's you know it's just it's incredible yeah, it and is. because of that i mean there's been a lot of research done on this you know in terms of what happens when there is not a father in the home and you know, I just, I just want to say some, some of you dads out there today, maybe you had a loving, caring father that spent a lot of time mentoring you. Maybe you grew up with one that paid no attention to you. Or maybe you even grew up without a father. You know, we have all kinds. And so yeah. this, today we're honoring all the fathers. Yeah. But I wanted to spend a minute and just get some statistics so we can kind of look at this. It's, it's a sobering thing. I have some statistics here. Oh, okay. Those that are, we call them fatherless kids, okay? four times greater in poverty. Those homes are in poverty four times. Wow. Seven times more likely to have teen pregnancy in that home. Another one is abuse of drug and alcohol. And in those homes that are fatherless, the kids are more likely to end up in prison than the other homes. Wow. 
and 2%, I'm sorry, not 2%, two times, two times more likely the kids in fatherless homes drop out of high school wow. and never complete high school. And here's, here's, the, here's the statistic that just was startling to me. 279% more likely, kids in fatherless homes, 279% more likely to carry a gun and deal in drugs. Wow, that is a huge number. You know, it's so huge. it is. I mean, it's, you know, it's a bit of a tragedy, but I also think there's a great call today for fathers to, you know, to step up and take the, take the family by their arms and hug them and be with the kids. I mean, it's, it's so, so important. Well, you know, I, I, I don't have a scripture verse I was thinking about as, as we're preparing yeah. for today. It's from Ezekiel. And God's, you know, <clears throat> speaking to them. It's from Ezekiel 22. And, he's, and God's saying, you know, I searched for a man among them who would just build up a wall, stand in the gap, yeah. okay? Yeah. Stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it. But, but he said, I found no one. And, and obviously what he's talking to me in today's, you know, if we put it in framework of today's, how about, you know, just to build up a wall is to restore the home. You know, right. I'm trying to restore the home and help protect it from right. the enemy right. that's out there that so desperately is attacking, the Amer especially the American family. Yes. It's big time under attack, you know. Stand in the gap, right? We, mm. we, we need dads. Mm. We need you out there. Right. Stand in the gap and to protect the family from right. what's going on in the world around us. Yeah, for You know sure. what, though? You know what, Randy? I'm sitting, I'm looking around, and I forgot to ask you, where the heck are we today? <laughs> Well, first of all, you want to know, you notice that we hit, we're in paper cups today. I see that. This is, this is free coffee. I, oh, oh, it's free. Okay. It's free, free coffee. Maybe, maybe you don't know. I only drink out of ceramic. <laughs> okay, but today well, I drink okay. out of paper. Here's the, okay. tr here's the truth. <laughs> all right. I forgot the ceramic church at the Red Door mugs today. Oh, okay. Okay. So, okay. All right. You're forgiven. So we had to do the paper cups. Okay. But listen, we are in, uh, this is called McCarroll's Kitchen, and you know, a lot of times People say, hey, i got to get out of the kitchen. The heat's too hot. Well, today we want to get in the kitchen because it's too hot out there. Oh, amen. But McCarroll's <laughs> Kitchen is uh, part of uh, the country club here at Trilogy Polo. So we, uh, we're invited back here once again, the opportunity to do our morning mix here in the club. Yeah, yeah. And McCarroll's Kitchen uh, is named after June Hill Robinson McCarroll. And June Hill was... In fact, there's a restaurant called June Hill as well. She, I've eaten here at that yeah. restaurant. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Back in the early 1900s, she was one of the only physicians in the desert here within 100 miles of this area between Palm Springs and the Salton Sea. Wow. So this is just another way of honoring her. Oh, yeah. You know, honoring oh, her, yeah. and her and her husband, Taylor, who happened to be the station manager for the train that came through here. So. Wow. A little bit of history, and maybe that's a little too much history. Well, but it's interesting. You know? Very interesting, yeah. But we're here at uh, McCarroll's Kitchen. Maybe we could uh, cook a little breakfast later. Well, I was hoping you were going to do that. You do know how to cook, don't you? <laughs> well, we got a big enough kitchen. We can <laughs> yeah, figure it out, figure I'm it out. sure. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> so uh, why don't you give us an update on some other things that are yeah, happening yeah, here yeah, at the yeah. church? Well, you know, Angel Tree, which, which you all have heard um, this week, you probably should have gotten an email about it, you know, but uh, Angel Tree Camp's coming. The kids yes. are going to be able to yeah. meet this year and go out to camp. So right. we're so looking forward to getting them out there. They're hoping to have 30 to 40 kids, bring them all out to camp. Uh, FCA's doing the same thing. Um, they're all taken there. I think the last count was close to 80 or 90 kids that FCA oh, was going to take great, here from the great. desert and bringing them back out to right. camp. And then, you know, we're walking into the summer and now things are starting to loosen up for us and we're going to be able to start meeting more and more in person. And so we're just working on upcoming Bible studies for the summer. And so just, you know, be looking at your emails for this. We'll, you know, we'll be sending yeah. more information out. That's a good point. That's a good yeah. point, Paul. Please check your email each week. Uh, you know, all the information updates on the church go out yeah. via an email blast. Yeah. And by the way, we're continuing diligently to work on a place that we can this summer gather as a family in person. Yeah. All right. Oh my God. I, I think that's coming up. You know, I'm getting, I, I'm, I'm, I want getting to close. say, we're I want close. to say something now. We just <laughs> can't. But getting hey, close. So hang on. Yeah. It's stand coming. by, stand by, stand by. by. Stand yeah. by. It's coming. Yes. Well, listen, um, you know, besides the update on gathering, yeah. wanted to just mention that. I think I we have a video. Tonight. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we have a very special video for you dads out there. And so we just like to take a few moments and, and let's watch that together.
what what an awesome, amazing clip honoring dads today. It huh? really is, and it's so true, so much of it. You know, yeah. it's so powerful. Yeah. It so is. powerful. Well, hope hope you enjoyed that little video clip. You know, we just kind of wanted to finish up the morning mix here this morning with that as a way to honor all the dads out there. And uh, our heart goes out to them all. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we want to honor you. And we also just want to let you know that God is calling all of us, all of us dads, back to him. If, if we've wandered a little bit, he's calling us back to him. So yeah. take that opportunity this coming week and weeks coming up to get close to him. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be talking about that this morning. You know, it's oh, good. God right now getting a hold of us for the men. It's a, it's a wake-up call. If ever, ever in a time in our country that God's calling men to step up, this is it. Great. So yeah, can I close great. in yeah, prayer? Yeah, close this in prayer. If you you would. know what? So, Father, I want to thank you so much. First off, for the dads that are no longer here, the dads mm -hmm. that are with you now, for all the dads here and around this country and around the world, Lord, yeah. I just ask that you're that your presence be with them, that your guidance be powerful in their lives. Father, that they will continue to turn to you for direction, Father. Mm -hmm. Follow the light that you have set before them, that they would be that rock, that they would be that wall within their family. So Father, I want to thank you and honor and hold up all the dads, mm -hmm. Father, in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen and amen. Amen. <laughs> All, All right. right. We'll see you. Well, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. God bless. Well, good morning and happy Father's Day. Uh, the, today, this message, I mean, obviously it's focused towards dads, but uh, it's for any man or any woman out there. I think what God has given me, I feel very confident what God has given me will be uh, a great direction for all of us. But before I get started, you know what I want to do today? I want to start with a little Father's Day humor. I came across a story that when uh, Peter was 16 years old, he finally got a hold of his driver's license. So in order to celebrate the special day, the whole family went out to the driveway and they climbed into the car to enjoy the first official drive. But however, it was interesting, Dad went to the back seat where he sat right behind his son. So his son Bob, when he saw his dad, said, Dad, boy, I guess you must be fed up with the front seat after teaching me how to drive for all these past few months. And right, Dad? And Dad goes, no, son, that's not true at all. I'm going to sit back here and kick the back of your seat while you drive, just like you've been doing to me for the last 16 years. <laughs> Come on, that's funny, right? All right, I got one more for you. There are two, two friends sitting around talking, and the first friend says, hey, what does your father do for a living? And the second friend goes, well, he's a magician. He performs tricks, like sawing people in half. And the first friend goes, wow. Do you have any brothers, any sisters? And, uh, and the friend goes, I sure do. I got four half sisters and a half brother. <laughs> hey, come on, that was funny, that was funny. Listen, as we start this morning, uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to grab them, open up to Romans uh, chapter 13. Also, I wanna encourage you, if you generally don't take notes, I'm gonna give you four key points today. I encourage you, get a pen and paper, um, and just kind of follow along. So we're going to look at Romans 13, 11 and 12. Now, what I'm reading to you from is from the message translation. And this is what it says. It says, don't get so absorbed and exhausted in, the, in taking care of your day-by-day -day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off, oblivious to God. The night is about over and dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. Paul is saying, today is the day for you and for me. It's time for us. He's saying, wake up, wake up, look around. What's God doing? Listen, there's ever been a time in our country to wake up to what's going on. It's now. He, but he's telling us, hey, wake up to the truth. Wake up to God's love. Wake up to his power. Wake up to the full meaning and the implications of the resurrection in your life. And, and men, 
and to wake up to the fact that God has a plan and a purpose for your life and my life, and he wants us to ensure that we're stepping into it. You know, the Apostle Paul's calling all of us into a deeper level in our walk with Christ. He's calling you and I to a higher level of integrity and accountability with himself and with others. He's calling you to a broader, wider reach of your influence for his kingdom. He's calling you to be a man, a man who lives by convictions, not for convenience. He's calling you to be a man who lives not just by your word, but by a man of his word. You see, we're going to look at what happened in the lives of God's people and a story found in the Old Testament. All right, so if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn back to Joshua, and we're going to look at Joshua in chapter 24. And we're going to see now, as you're looking, Joshua's just led the people, well, he's, the story's been, he's led the people into the promised land, and now he's come to the end of his life. And this is his farewell address. And he's challenging them to a deepened commitment and a renewed dedication to integrity, to step, a step up in their commitment to God. As we read this, you're going to see he's challenging them not to just exist, but to fully possess this promised land that God's given to them. And I want you to notice here, there's an eternal truth here, and it's a don't miss this. You know, if this is your first time watching this, you know, I have, I throw into my message something called don't miss this. And that's if you miss anything else I say, try to remember these don't miss this. But this is the first one today. The church is only as strong as its people's commitment to God. I mean, it's powerful, remember that. And for us today, you know, to possess the land, you know what that means? It means to fully engage in and to live out the fullness of life in Christ. No longer living by the world's values, but now living according to God's values. Are you hearing me about making a difference with your life and the world around you for the kingdom of God? So in Joshua 24, you can go to verse 14 through 15. It says this. This is powerful. Joshua said, now therefore, he's at the end of his life now, remember. He says, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And do away with the gods which your fathers served beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. He says, I want you, and he goes, I want you to serve the Lord. But if it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, well, fine. He says, you know, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the Euphrates River, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land right now that you're living in. But I love this part. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, I, I, I want you to notice four things. These are the things I, I want to challenge. It's a challenge from Joshua, and, I, and I'm encouraging you. I, I hope you write these down. So here's the first one. The choice he's calling them to is intentional. Did you catch that? Hear what he said, he says, choose for yourselves whom you're gonna serve. Okay, do you understand? No one can choose for you. Your wife can't choose for you. Your friends can't, your parents can't choose for you. It's your choice. You can't follow the Lord accidentally, right? We all know that, right? It's gotta be an intentional decision. Choose this day whom you will serve. And second, did you notice know, the choice, he says, it's urgent. He said, choose for yourselves this day. He said, today. He said, today, right now, in this Kairos moment, to achieve your God's intended purpose. Did you notice what he didn't say? He didn't say, now let's talk about this. All right, and then why don't you, you know what? Why don't you go on, take a couple days, go on home, Mull it over, have a cup of coffee, decide, then come on back, and, and let's talk about what you think. No, 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 no. He says, no, the time is now. Choose this day whom you will serve. And the third thing to notice, what he notices is that the choice is unavoidable. Because he said, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, because by intention or default, oh, you're going to serve somebody. You know, Bob Dylan had it right in his song when he said, it might be the devil and it might be the Lord, 
but you're going to have to serve somebody. You know why he said that? Because you will. It's inevitable. You're going to serve somebody. And fourth, Joshua says, the choice in this one, I think, even though the other three are really important, this one, this is generational. As for me and my house. Did you catch that? So let me tell you what else is at stake. Are you ready? It's your kids. It's your grandchildren. It's your great-grandchildren's futures at stake. Are you hearing me? You must take responsibility for your household, for the values that your family is going to live by, and for the God that they're going to worship. Boy, I hope you're grasping this. Joshua told his people, throw away those foreign gods that are among you. Remember what he stated in verse 15? Choose for yourselves today whom you're going to serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you're living right now. So you're thinking, well, how does that apply to you today? Well, it's real simple. The gods of Egypt, they're the gods of your past. He's saying, yeah, I mean, remember, they came out of Egypt to slavery for 400 years. He's basically saying, yeah, come on, you want to stay in slavery? He's talking to all of us. You want to stay in slavery? He's saying by worshiping old gods that they're holding on to old values, that they're bringing old lifestyles with them, that they're carrying the memories of their slavery with them back right, right now into the future. Joshua says, basically, listen, he goes, you got to let go of that stuff. You got to get it out of your life. So I got to ask you. Here's the question I want to ask you. What enslaved you before you gave your life to Jesus Christ? What enslaved you before you gave your life to Jesus Christ? You see, God's saying, walk away from it. <laughs> Don't bring it with you anymore. Leave it behind you. Get rid of the gods of Egypt. And more importantly, even more than that, get rid of the gods of the Amorites and the land that you're living. You see, the gods and the Amorites are the gods of our culture right now, friends. And he's saying, don't live by the value system of the world around you. Because there's going to be a high price to pay if you live according to the world's values. Friends, it just is. I mean, look at these two verses. Look at this one from Jonah. Jonah 2.8 says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. And how about 2 Kings 17? It said, they followed worthless idols and themselves became, what's it say, everyone? Yeah, worthless. So here's the question we have to ask, all right? Here's the question. Am I holding on to something? Right now, I ask yourself, either from my past or the value system of this world that's causing me to forfeit the fullness of God's grace in my life. His full grace in my marriage, in my family, in my finances, in my business. Is there something I'm holding on to that's keeping me from getting a grip on what God really wants to do in my life? Is there? God has called each of us into a whole new way of living. That's what Paul meant in 2 Corinthians 5.17. He says, listen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. He's saying, listen, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. That old life has, that old life has gone and a new life's begun. Understand, he's saying it's begun. It hasn't happened right away. It's over time. It's a process. So scripture first that says that he who begun the good work and you will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. It's a process. It's going through it. So I need to ask you some tough questions. I know it's not normally what I do, but I need to ask you some tough questions. But they're questions that we all have to ask ourselves and take a good, hard look at our own lives. And you're the only person, <laughs> you're the only one that can answer these questions. And your answers are only between you and God. It's nobody else's business between you and God. So here's a question. Are there any idols that you're sacrificing to? Are there any idols that you're sacrificing to? Like, for instance, are you sacrificing your family to an idol of success? 
Are you sacrificing your ethics to an idol of money or possessions? How about this? Are you sacrificing decency to an idol of indecent entertainment? Are you sacrificing moral purity to an idol of immoral relationship? Are you sacrificing God's highest good for you to idols of past memories, lifestyles, behaviors that you're just not willing to let go of yet? Let me ask you this. Who's in charge of your life? Who's in charge of your life? Who are you living for? Are you living for yourself or for a higher purpose? For God himself? Look, search your heart. Look for anything you're hanging on to that's keeping you from fully possessing the land fully possessing the new life that God wants you to have in Christ. Do you see what Joshua is doing? Joshua challenges all of us just to this higher level of personal commitment and devotion. And, but he says, as for me and my house, as for me and my house, he's not He's speaking not just for himself. Do you get what? He's speaking for his family, his entire household. That's what he's doing. He's making a decision and a commitment on their behalf. And he's encouraging all the other men to do the same thing. He's encouraging all you men out there to do, to do the same thing. He's saying to them, step up, guys. Take responsibility for the spiritual health and the well-being of your family. He says, step up and do this. Look at this is the most important. Don't miss this. I think I have today. You cannot delegate your family's spiritual destiny. Oh, man. I'm going to say that again. You cannot delegate your family's spiritual destiny to anyone else. Friends, we're talking about forever. Their spiritual destiny. You have to ask yourself the question. You gotta ask yourself this. When your kids and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren look at your life, hey, believe me, they do. Do they think that God is essential or is he optional to you? What do they think? Is God, do they see God being essential in your life or do they see God just being optional? As I said when I started, we're all, you know, coming at this from different places in our spiritual life. I know some of you have followed the Lord for a long time. And I know some of you are just getting started. And then there's some of you who have had your ups and downs, and so you may not even, gosh, you know, Paul, I'm not even sure where to begin. But young or old, single or married, kids, no kids. My hope is that you're hearing me today not as a judge, but as a friend who cares about you. As a pastor who cares about this church, calling you to join me to make a deeper commitment to be a godly man. Here's another don't miss this. If there is one thing this world desperately needs right now, it's more godly men. Did you hear me? If there's one thing this world desperately needs right now, it's more godly men. All we got to do is look around and see what's going on all around us. I love what Paul says in Romans 13, verse 11. Paul says, this is important. He goes, do this, knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from the sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. You know, there's a famous childhood prayer we probably all have heard. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Friends, the Apostle Paul told us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Men, that's all of us, everyone listening right now that each one may receive the things done in the body 
according to what he has done, whether it's good or whether it's bad. So let me ask you, what do you think about this? What would people say at your eulogy? What would they say? What would your family say? What would your kids say? What would the Lord say? Would he say to you, good job, good and faithful servant? Or you wicked and lazy servant, cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. We're just going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What would he say to you? What would your family say about you? Listen, men and women, these are questions to ask ourselves. Though the main push obviously is towards men today, but we have to ask ourselves, am I seeking him? Am I seeking God? Am I seeking him truly on a daily basis? Am I trying to hear from him? You know, the scripture verse that talks the sheep know his voice. Do you know his voice? Do you know God's voice? Do you know how to hear God's voice? Or getting into his word and following what he has to say? Are we holding our thoughts captive? Are we? Are we holding them captive? You know, the power of the tongue, scripture talks so much about it. How, it just, uh, how a spark can start a forest fire. So can the words that come out of our mouth if we don't watch what comes out of them. We've got to keep them captive. Are we using our words to edify? Are we? Are we edifying at home? Are you edifying your wife, your kids? Out on the golf course, in your workplace? I love what Paul says here in Philippians 4, 8 and 9. I think it's such so wise. It says, brothers and sisters, he goes, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure. Are you listening to these words? Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. As for the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, you know, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Boy, is that one thing our families need? Isn't that one thing we all need? Don't we all need the God of peace to be with us? What are you focusing on? What are you guiding on? What are you listening to? What are you, what are you following? Are, are, did you ask yourself, am I living a life that's transparent? In other words, if someone was to follow you around all day long, whether it was on the golf course or tennis or grocery shopping or whatever, what would it look like to them? Would your yes be yes? Your no be no? You have to ask yourself, am I striving to meet the mission God's called me to? Are you? Am I actually walking out my calling? How am I using my gifts and my talents? As you look around your life, is there any fruit in my life? Is there any fruit coming? I'm talking about eternal fruit that lasts forever. Do I mourn for those who don't know God? Don't know Jesus? How about this? Do the things that break God's heart break mine? Have you asked that? Do I have a passion to make disciples? Can people see Jesus in me? <laughs> Listen, man, this is, don't miss this. Inconsistent fathers produce insecure children. And unreliable husbands produce unstable marriages. Remember that, hang on to that. As the Apostle Paul told us in Hebrews 4, and if you write this down, Hebrews 4, 11 through 13, he basically is saying, so men, therefore, let's make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God, are you listening, is active, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of the soul and the spirit of both the joints and the marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And this is so important. There is no creature hidden from his sight. You understand, you can't hide from God, but all things are open and laid bare to his eyes from him to whom we must all answer. So when God says, when you're standing there before him one day, he turns around, he's looking behind, he goes, hey, who'd you bring with you? 
Would there be anybody there? Will there? How about your family? Men, dads, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, great-great-grandfathers, fathers-to-be. I have a closing story for you. I tell this at every Father's Day. It's powerful. It's from Patrick Morley and his book called The Man in the Mirror. And he tells a story of a fishing trip. A group of fishermen had landed in a secluded bay in Alaska and had a great day fishing for salmon. But when they returned to their seaplane, they were surprised to discover that it was aground because of the fluctuating tides. They had no option except to wait until the next morning until the tides, well, obviously came back in, right? But when they took off, oh my gosh, when they took off that following morning, they only got a few feet off the ground and they came crashing into the sea. Being aground, see, what happened, being aground the day before, it punctured one of the pontoons and it filled up with water. The seaplane slowly began to sink and there were three men and a 12-year-old boy named Mark. They prayed, the men, they all got together, they prayed and they jumped into the icy cold waters to swim ashore. Oh, can you imagine how cold the water was and the riptide was strong? And two of the men reached the shore exhausted. But then they looked back and their companion, who was also a very strong swimmer, didn't swim to shore because his 12-year-old son wasn't strong enough to make it. They saw that father with his arms around his son being swept out to sea. He chose to die with his son rather than to live without him. You see, there's a fact of life that most kids don't know. We love our children so much, we die for them. If I were to ask every father who's listening here today, there's not one of you that wouldn't stand up and wouldn't do the same thing for his son or his daughter. I dare say every father would leap to his feet. So fathers, as we close here, I want to encourage you to bless your children. Bless them by a meaningful touch. Give them a hug. Bless them through verbal affirmation. Tell them how proud you are of them. Let them know how valuable and important they are. Help them develop a positive outlook for their future. And most of all, bless them. Let them know you're committed to them. Dads, future dads, it's not enough to speak the words. Set the example by your willingness to sacrifice for them, to pray, to spend time in helping them develop their gifts, playing games, whatever it is you're doing with them. So on this day, God's, I want to bless all of your dads out there. God, blessings on all of your fathers, all of you, all of your future dads. Father, I ask that your spirit would just come along all of them. Give them the courage to wake up anything that might have been sleeping in their spirit, Father. Bring them forth. Make them stand in the gap today for their parents. We need, we need godly men, Father, more than we ever need them today. We need you to empower them to come alongside them with a special boost of your Holy Spirit, to give them the courage and the strength that they need to be the best dad, the best husband, the best men that they can possibly be. And I thank you, Father, for them and to be with them as the sheer unwinds. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you.